Good morning. In the course of thinking about, reflecting on, waiting for inspiration, whatever the case for that particular day, some stories come back to me that I've mentioned before, but bear mentioning again in the context of what I wanted to talk about today. And the story of the Korean monk, the quite elderly Korean monk that I was privileged to attend a small gathering and a talk he gave at my uh, alma mater, University of Hawaii, in a very interesting, beautiful venue called the Kennedy Theater, dedicated to JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a great president of the United States. And there's just a place that I liked. It was a comfortable place. It, uh, amphitheater, seating, nice, felt intimate anyway. This elderly gentleman and his regalia, his robe and his uh, rank of office, I guess, but simple. And the staff, I remember, particular beautiful, beautiful staff. But he opened up, and this was a group of professors and graduate students and uh, interested undergraduate students. And he opened up with a simple question that like many simple things <laughs> is not answered simply. He began by saying, who is I, me, my? And you know professors, they're never short of verbiage. They're never caught short for an answer. We're trained to think on our feet because after all, we stand in front of Students who, <laughs> in many cases, are smarter than we are and loaded with questions. So you need to answer or attempt to answer in a relatively demanding time frame. So we're practiced, as I say. And it didn't take long for answers, almost spontaneously. As soon as the questions out, answers came. And being an orderly type, people didn't shout out answers. They suggested answers one at a time. Some very elaborate, on and on and on. And each time the monk listened carefully and then said, I will hit you with this stick. And listen for the next answer. And this went on for whew, to the point that it was beginning to get uncomfortable. How does this simple question stump all these professors and graduate students? Fifteen, twenty minutes, 
And he was attentive. He did indeed listen to each response. But he responded with the same answer. I will hit you with the stick. And this led me directly to what I was aspired to talk about today. That the truth, reality, what's so, is intrinsically unknowable. And as a lover of irony, I appreciated very much that I had spent an entire lifetime in the pursuit of reality. What so? So I was listening quite attentively to the monk. I, me, my. What is it? Because after all, this is probably the roots of inquiry. Where do I fit in the scheme of things? And of course, this becomes a larger picture of what is it all about? Is there a purpose? These big metaphysical questions usually originate, at least for me, in the smaller in the much smaller arena of wondering who is I, me, my. So I didn't venture a, an answer to the venerable monk. I just awaited his illumination. I thought someone is going to give me the answer to the question at this point in my life that spent a good 20 years wrestling with. And the monk looked out. He was a master because he had the attention of us all. And he said, don't know. And to date, that's not only the best answer I've heard for what is I, me, my. But the only answer, and it became more and more true if truth has degrees of relevance, which it, it doesn't, but what I meant is that I became more and more, <laughs> there I am, the I, more and more aware of the truth. And recognizing this answer, don't know, as the most meaningful, relevant 
inclusive, sweeping answer I've ever heard. And I paid close attention. He didn't say, I don't know. He simply said, don't know. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of irony. And for many, they don't appreciate the irony, the irony of life, the irony of existence. But for me, there I am, me. <laughs> Without using a pronoun, <laughs> it's tough. But as I Having spent many, many hours on contemplation, rumination, consideration, the irony of reality is that it's intrinsically unknowable in its very nature is its unknowability it remains in the realms of unknown even after you've embraced the non-divisive, all-inclusive unity of shared existence, which you couch in the language of I want to know. Well, the I disappears and it's left for reference only. And this is how I use I, me, my just to point to this existence, because indeed, existence of the physical body, the personality, is part of reality, part of what is so. So to use the pronouns I, me, my is to designate, is to point the way of the existence of this physical body and the aura that surrounds it. Personal aura is, if I spread my hands out as far as I can, it's about twice that distance. But uh, for some, they have a tighter shell. And I pause here because the temptation to use 
the pronouns I, me, my. It's tough. I don't know how aware you are of your aura. But as soon as someone comes in, the space that I've grown to identify as mine, My senses are on alert. It's of course not necessarily a bad thing, but it seems like an invitation would be better than just a trespasser. But for my intents and purposes, a smaller aura within the larger one. And I must point out at this point that I say it's twice the length of our arm spread, but in actuality, it goes to infinity. It stretches forever because there are no endings, there are no limitations. But for practical purposes. So this, if I made a circle with my hands like this, anyone coming in there certainly needs my permission, implicit or explicit. So that means that obviously I don't like mass transit. I don't like being pressed up against people. I in particular are sensitive to someone too close behind me, which is a little bit unusual because you would think that uh, you wouldn't be aware. It's beyond your peripheral vision. But I've also mentioned before that, for lack of a better term, there's a fourth eye in the back of your head. We're all of, aware of the pituitary, the third eye, the all-seeing eye, but I experienced the opening of a fourth eye. And I really haven't heard too much talk from any other source about a fourth eye, but all I can share is that experience. And there must be something to it because you hear people refer to he can see out of the back of his head. And that indeed is true. So setting boundaries obviously is an artificial construct. There is no boundary because Boundary implies two things, ownership, that's mine, and separation. Well, we truly own nothing, and we truly aren't separated. It's only our ignorance of the maya, the illusion, the egoic sense of separation. And these are discarded. Mm -hmm. 
I just was, uh, some people talk about at the time of awakening that you might still have remnants of the ego and they have to be uh, smiled at, recognized and let go in the process of maturing into your spirituality. But I've mentioned before that another guise of the crafty ego comes in the spiritual ego. So even though you might have discarded the personal smaller ego with a little e, watch out for the ego with the capital E. In fact, it's all in caps. E G O, all caps. This is a final trap and perhaps the most difficult trap to not only perceive but to dismiss. The ego is in the guise of a learned master, a guru, a holy man that walks on earth. Holy with an H. And I've embraced holy with the W, W, H, O, L, E. The whole. We are indeed the whole. Whereas whole with an H, like holy. Also, can be a trap. You can fall into the hole, H-O-L-E, with your whole body, W-H-O-L-E. So on the path to holy is a hole. <laughs> and many, many, in fact, most of the people who set out to be a holy man, a guru, can be trapped in this egoic structure, the spiritual ego, and many never escape it in their current lifetime. They have to come back again and work on it. So what I suggest at least, pardon the pronoun, for me, was a lack of interest in proclaiming myself as anything other than an ordinary man. I did slip into a little bit of this spiritual ego in that I wanted to share what happened to me in my immaturity. I've mentioned before that upon awakening, I experienced myself as a sleeping baby, abandoned on a dirty, cold, sidewalk and I had to fend for myself. So those first couple years were tough 
and I've also shared before and since today is kind of rehash of things I've talked about before because they fit in the scheme of things for my present purposes. It seems that eight years, eight human years, <laughs> are contained in one post-awakening year. So after one year, you're eight, and so on. And as I'm nearing 48, spiritual years old. I'm relaxing into the enjoyment of middle age. For after all, 48 is about the middle, isn't it? We push it to 60. It's even getting pushed to 70, which implies that you could be 120 or 140 years old. Hmm. What a chore. And why I'm sharing this in my middle age, I've been becoming very relaxed, very accepting that almost everything remains in the realms of intrinsically unknowable. Who is I, me, my, don't know. And this monk had mastered not using the pronouns, not saying, I don't know, but simply saying, don't know. And smiling, sharing his sense of okayness with not knowing. And that is an exercise in itself. You spend a lifetime wanting to know, or at least some of us did. All of us will one day or another. I had mentioned in my sharing, leave zeal, for the zealots reading a Western scholar's take on Buddhism and his sense of urgency to share awakening, to get everyone to wake up before you could rest in the joys of your own awakening. He saw this as a selfish act, not completed until everyone was sharing. And yet, before that, he talked about continuity. He talked more about karma and reincarnation than 
most monks ever do, going into great details about the joys, the serenity, the peace that comes with knowing that you are not born and you won't die, that you're a continuity of the infinite. Now for me, knowing that took away any sense of urgency, took away any sense that my practice was selfish. Because almost by definition for me, it focused on I, me, my. Had to come to terms with not only not knowing, but accepting, living with ambiguity. Not only living with ambiguity, but appreciating there could be no other way. So all I wanted to share with this man is that he understands the timelessness. He should relax and understand that each of us has our time our time of awakening, our time of removing the veil of ignorance, the veil of separation, the veil of division. To get a peek, because it's so grand that you better look at it with just a quick blink at first, for fear of being overwhelmed with its exclusiveness. So, relax, watch, listen, and if you're called upon to offer advice or worse yet solutions just smile and point and the irony is that it doesn't matter which way you point you point in in to go out out to go in whichever way you point but most importantly listen without judgment let each discover for themselves what is so.